Is the church the new Israel? In any way has the church replaced the old Israel? Are Christians spiritual Jews? We'll answer it all today. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks for joining us, friends, on Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. This is your Thoroughly Jewish host, Michael Brown. Delighted to be with you. Don't, don't pick up the phone to call with questions, comments, because today I'm just going to do solid teaching. By solid, I mean without interruption, aside from the commercial breaks we take along the way during the hour. But I just want to open the scriptures and address these very, very important issues. Now, if you do have questions, you can call tomorrow. God willing, you've got questions, we've got answers. We'll take Jewish-related questions as well that follow up from today. Or you can always write to us via the website. Just go to askdrbrown.org, and you'll see a place to contact us. You can send your questions, and I may answer them on the air. We may answer them via email, but either way, we will do our best to get back to you with answers. But today, listen as carefully as you can. If you miss any part of the broadcast, any part of the hour, go to the website, askdrbrown.org, later today, and just click on latest broadcast. You can listen to it all without interruption. But what I want to first lay out is why this is an important issue. And there are two sides Why is it important to followers of Jesus? Why is it important to the Jewish people? It's important to understand, as followers of Jesus, who we really are. And we we want to get this right, because getting it wrong would put our identity in the wrong place. So if, for example, you do not find your primary identity in Jesus— but your primary identity becomes in, well, I've got to discover my Jewish roots, or I've taken on a spiritual Jewish uh, identity, or I want to find out what tribe of Israel I'm from. It's misplaced. It's misplaced. Now, if you are literally a blood descendant from the children of Israel, and you're curious, do I just assume I'm from the tribe of Judah, or could I be from another tribe and, and were they mingled in together? Is there a way to know that? That's, that's a perfectly curious, fine question to know. If you discover, hey, I'm Jewish. I didn't realize I had Jewish blood. Fine. That can affect your sense of, of who you are. Just like if you were raised as an orphan and now you found out who your parents were, your biological parents, you know, that impacts you on a certain level. But ultimately, our identity is found in Jesus. Spirituality is found in Yeshua. Not in Jewishness, but in Yeshua. And even though there's no male or female Jew or Gentile in the Messiah, does that mean that a man is now a woman, or a woman is now a man, or a Jew is now a Gentile, or a Gentile is not a Jew? Surely not. But it especially matters for the Jewish people, because the question remains, are there promises from God that remain for them, or are the promises only realized in the Messiah? In other words, the promises are fulfilled in Jesus, and in Jesus, Jew and Gentile are blessed, but outside of Jesus, there are no specific promises that remain for the Jewish people. Is that true? If the new Israel, the true Israel, the true Jew is is spiritually defined, what about the old Israel? And is God working physically with the Jewish people in the earth today? What does that mean on a practical level? Hey, everybody lives in a house or an apartment. You need somewhere to live. And, and we, uh, we live here in the United States of America. Wherever you're listening, that's where you live. What if you're told that as a people, you don't have claims to your homeland because God's not dealing in this earthly way. Everything today is spiritual. Would that affect you? Yeah. When it's where you're trying to live in safety, it sure would. The bottom line is, though, what does the Bible say? I want to sort this out as clearly as I can, because questions keep coming up. We want to address this through the Word. Give us strength to always do what's right. 
It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. We are going to continue our discussion today on the Line of Fire, answering some thoroughly Jewish questions on this thoroughly Jewish Thursday. Specifically, in any sense, is the church the new Israel? In any sense, has the church replaced the old Israel? In any sense, is the church the fulfillment of the old Israel? In any sense, are individual Christians spiritual Jews? I won't be taking calls. I just want to go through Scripture and discuss these things. Now, I know Christians who love the Lord, who love the Jewish people, who pray for the salvation of Jewish people, who do not have an anti-Semitic bone in their body, and they believe the church is the spiritual Israel, or they believe that they individually are spiritual Jews. In fact, some people I've met who love the nation of Israel the most deeply still believe these things. I remember being in Scandinavia and having these precious Christians come up to me, who older Christians who had a deep love for Israel. You could tell how much they prayed for the Jewish people and loved them. And yet, and yet, they, they said to me, we are spiritual Jews. Now, they never in a million years imagined that that would mean that natural Jews were no longer natural Jews and that no promises applied to them. So I understand you can feel this way and love the Lord and and find your primary identity in Jesus and just believe that based on certain scripture or just spiritual principles that you are spiritual Jews. I understand that. The only question is ultimately what does scripture say? Let's first think about what Paul writes in Galatians 3, that in, in the Messiah, in Christ, there's neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean that male and female distinctives cease in Jesus? No, of course not. Paul gives instructions to men, does he not? Paul gives instructions to women, and there are different instructions, and the relationships are, are different. So clearly, he's not saying that male female, female distinctions no longer exist, nor is he saying that men, males, are now spiritual females and females are now spiritual males. Obviously, obviously not. The same way when he said there's neither slave nor free, there were still people who were slaves and there were still people who were free, and Paul wrote to them accordingly. He wrote to slave masters and he wrote to slaves, did he not? In the same way with there's neither Jew or Gentile, it doesn't mean that Jewish and Gentile distinctions end any more than a church just has gender-neutral bathrooms for everyone because there's neither male nor female. Obviously not. Although these days there's pressure to do these kinds of things in society, but from a secular viewpoint. Anyway, that'll take me too far afield. So when he says there's neither Jew nor Gentile, what does he mean? Neither male nor female, slave nor free. There's no class system. There's no caste system. There's no system where you're more privileged spiritually or you have closer access to God or you're more favored. No, in that sense, we are all complete level equal at the foot of the cross. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. There is no spiritual superiority for a Jewish believer over a Gentile believer or vice versa. There is no spiritual superiority of a man over a woman in the Lord, over slave, over free, or vice versa. No, none of those. In Jesus, we have complete equality. Now, we don't know when this custom started. It could have been something that existed all the way back in Paul's day, because it's uncanny that a male traditional Jew, when he wakes up in the morning, one of the first prayers he prays is, I thank you, God, that I am not a woman a Gentile, or a slave. You say, wow, that sounds bigoted and xenophobic and racist and misogynist and all whatever terms we use today. Actually, what's meant is, Lord, I thank you for giving me the privilege of, of being called to observe all of your laws. For a traditional Jew, that's considered a great privilege. So in point of fact, a, a woman, because of, certain bodily limitations at certain times of the month or childbirth related things or caring for a child, she's exempt from certain commandments. Uh, The same thing with a slave, even a Jewish slave can't be required to do everything because he may not be able to 
because of his master. And the same with the Gentile. The Gentile is obviously not required to keep all of the Torah. Well, Paul's saying, and again, especially interesting if that prayer existed in his day, that those are false distinctions, that we all have equal access to God and equal standing with God and equal calling to serve him in obedience, however that specific calling works itself out. So we don't want to misunderstand that. You say, well, uh, Dr. Brown, I was listening to your debate with Dr. Gary DeMar, and in, in that debate, uh, he started by saying something, and you actually agreed with him. Well, what was it that Dr. DeMar said? And you can watch this or listen to it, actually, on YouTube. AskDrBrown.org. Just click on our YouTube channel, and you can listen to a very fruitful and cordial debate that I had with Dr. Gary DeMar about Israel, the promises to Israel. And he said, look, the idea that, that the church has replaced Israel is a complete misnomer because the church is the ecclesia. And he said that actually that that word church should not have been used in our English Bibles. It should have been congregation. He's absolutely right. This is one of the rules of translators. The rule number three of the King James translators was to maintain the old ecclesiastical terms, for example, church rather than congregation, because William Tyndale had broken away from that and had translated it with congregation. When Yeshua says in Matthew 16, I will build my congregation, not my church. The, the word church ultimately was related to physical building and structure and, and hence can be misleading in that way. Uh, I will build my ecclesia in Greek, but he would have spoken in Hebrew or Aramaic and used a word for the congregation. Uh, the same thing in, in Ephesians 5, that, that Jesus died for the Messianic congregation, for the congregation, for the assembly, to make us something beautiful. So uh, he was pointing out that we shouldn't have used a separate word church and that this is the congregation. It's always been the same ecclesia. This word was used a number of times in the Septuagint, ecclesia, to speak of the congregation in Old Testament times, the congregation of Israel. And now it's the, the congregation of the Messiah. It's just grown and expanded. There's much truth to that, and there's much I absolutely agree with. Saved Israel and the saved nations are now part of God's ecclesia, so the ecclesia, the congregation of God, has expanded its borders. True. How has it expanded its borders? It is now Israel plus the nations. Saved Israel plus the saved nations. The borders have been expanded. The ecclesia has been enlarged. The kahal, the edah, the Hebrew words. It, it has been enlarged. But the church, the ecclesia, has not replaced Israel, Israel still has its role and destiny within the ecclesia and for the world. The promises that were given to Israel still remain to Israel, just like individual promises to nations, specific promises to nations, I should say. Those promises remain if God gave them. So that's what we have to remember. Yes, the ecclesia, the messianic congregation, you could say God's people, the borders have been expanded. But that does not mean that Gentile believers have become Israel, that Gentile believers have become Jews. It means the borders of the people of God have been expanded to have one new man in the Messiah, Jew and Gentile, worshiping and serving God together. Now, that, that's the first thing I want to lay out. The second thing also has to do with Replacement theology versus fulfillment theology. Many Christians protest the idea of replacement theology. We haven't replaced anything. Rather, we believe in fulfillment theology. We believe in fulfillment theology, which says that all the promises of God to Israel were fulfilled in Jesus. So Jews in Jesus see the realization of those promises. Jews outside of Jesus do not. All right, problem number one with that idea is, is that there are physical land promises given to Israel that were not given to the nations. A specific physical piece of land that God would give Israel that was his inheritance that he would give to his people, and as his firstborn son, this is where they would live. To say that's fulfilled in Jesus makes it basically null and void if it means that the land promise doesn't remain. And here's the rub. Here's the real issue. Are, are you ready? This is the real issue. 
Replacement theology says God is finished with Israel as a distinct nation and people and promises remain to Israel for salvation, for individual Jews to be saved just like everyone else, but there are no national promises that remain. And you cannot say that God is dealing with the Jewish people as a people, as a nation, while they are in sin and away from God. Well, does fulfillment theology say the same thing? If fulfillment theology comes to the same conclusion, that the nation of Israel as a nation is left without promises, that the physical promises of restoration to the land no longer apply, that there will not be a, a guarantee or a promised turning of the Jewish people at the end of the age. In other words, if the promises to Israel no longer remain to them as a nation and even in unbelief, then you come to the exact same result, don't you? And that's the very thing I'm taking issue with today. God of light, hear our cry, send the fire. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thank you for joining us on this Thirdly Jewish Thursday. Special teaching as we ask is, is the church, the spiritual Israel, the new Israel, or Christians, spiritual Jews. Let's take a look at the vocabulary. I am not taking calls today, but you can call in tomorrow with your questions at ask, uh, excuse me, at, at uh, our normal Friday show. You can call in with your questions, or you can write them through askdrbrown.org, A-S-K-D-R-Brown.org. Best not to post questions on Facebook. Too easy for us to meet, uh, miss them there because of the amount of traffic we get. But by all means, by all means, uh, do write or do call with your questions. We love to hear from you. Let's look at the term Jew, all right? You're talking about a term that occurs over and over and over and over and over in the New Testament. I mean, we're not talking about 10 or 20 or 50 or even just 100 times. We're talking about uh, uh, scores and scores of times in the New Testament. Beginning in Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, where is he who's born king of the Jews. Uh, and, and then you'll, you'll see this over and over in the New Testament. So uh, he's asked in Matthew 27, 11, are you the king of the Jews? Obviously, he comes to the Jewish people. He's, he is the prophesied king of the Jews. He's the messianic king, right? So no question in the Gospels that, that Jew means Jew. It could also mean a Judean, so someone from the the province of Judea. It could in some cases mean Jewish leaders. You have that especially in John's gospel. But under no circumstances does it mean someone who was not born Jewish. Mark 1, 5. Um, he, he, uh, there went out to him all from the land of Judea and of Jerusalem, and they were baptized. So all of these different Jews going out to, uh, from Judea to confess their sins. And then Mark, the 15th chapter, are you the king of the Jews? The same parallels we've seen. Uh, Luke's gospel, the same thing over and over. Uh, he's getting mocked on the cross by religious leaders. If you're the king of the Jews, Luke 23, 37, save yourself. So no question, Jew means Jew there, correct? All right, so John 1, 19, the Jews sent priests and Levites. So that's the Judeans. Jewish leadership there. But throughout John's gospel, where the term occurs over and over, it's talking about Jewish people, flesh and blood Jews, correct? Uh, Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans, John the fourth chapter. Uh, salvation is of or from uh, the Jews, John 4, 22. He's explaining that to a Samaritan. He's talking about physical blood Jews over and over and over. So you have that throughout John's gospel. There, there's really no, no questioning of that. No dispute of that. The same thing when we get to the book of Acts. So I'm just saying, here's a term that occurs over, and I'm just looking at my Greek concordance here, over and over and over again in the New Testament, and consistently, consistently means a physical blood descendant, a a, a Jew, not just someone saying, oh, I'm a spiritual Jew, all right? So Acts 2.5, there were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation. Uh, Peter gets up to speak. And uh, uh, he says, you men of Judea, all you that dwell in Jerusalem, these are the Jewish people and those that have come from around the world. So we have it throughout the book of Acts. No change, just check every single reference to Jew, Jews in the book of Acts. 
And we go, we go right to the, to the end of the book of Acts, and we see it's the exact same thing. The term hasn't changed. Acts 28, 19, uh, when the Jews spoke against it, uh, the Jews objected, I was constrained to appeal to Caesar. So he's talking about the Jewish people, or specifically the Judeans, uh, those living in Judea. But clearly, once again, speaking about physical Jews. So this is now over and over and over again in the New Testament. Now we come to Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Well, it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Who does he mean there? Who does he mean? He's talking about physical descendants, Jewish people. Romans 2.9, tribulation and anguish will come to every soul that does evil, first for the Jew and also the Greek. Same in 2.10, uh, 217. Now we get to 228 in Romans. I'm sorry if I'm giving you too much scripture. Uh, it may be a little tedious, but I just want you to hear this. Romans 228 now says this, for he's not a Jew who's one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who's one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. You say, well, that settles it. A true Jew is the one who's a Jew on the inside, not on the outside. Well, well hang on. Paul just said, Romans 1, 16, 2, 9, 2, 10, 2, 17. So four times he's already referenced it, saying he's speaking of Jews as, as opposed to Gentiles. And then chapter 3, he now immediately, after what he's just said about, about the real Jew, the true Jew, Romans 3, 1, what does he say? What advantage then has the Jew? Or what's the profit of circumcision? He's talking about physical Jewish people. Uh, Now he says, Romans 3.9, he speaks about Jews and Gentiles. 3.29, the same thing. 9.24, he's called us not only of the Jews, but also of the Gentiles. Romans 10.12, there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek for the same Lord overall is rich to all who call upon him. In other words, every other time in Romans that he speaks of a Jew, in Romans 1 and Romans 2, uh, up through verse 17, and then in Romans 3, beginning verse 1, right to Romans 10, every single time he's talking about physical blood descendants. So what's his point in Romans 2, 28 and 29? He's not saying that physical Jews are not Jews. He's not saying that the promises don't remain to physical Jews. He's not saying that at all. What he's saying is don't get into some Jewish spiritual pride as if being a blood descendant makes you something. John the Immerser raised that very same issue, did he not? Saying, don't say we're, we're children of Abraham because God could raise up from the stones children of Abraham if he wanted to. So don't go boasting, oh, I'm Jewish. I have the special spiritual insight or the special spiritual connection. No, 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 no. What God's really looking at is the heart. That's why some translations add in the word only, okay? Some translations add in the word only, uh, a, a person is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, merely Jewish outwardly. Complete Jewish Bible, merely Jewish outwardly. ESV, merely one outwardly. NIV, only one outwardly. Nor is circumcision only a matter of the flesh. No, the real Jew, in other words, between two Jews, the real Jew is one who's a Jew inside who's circumcised in the heart and not only in the body, but he wasn't calling Gentiles there spiritual Jews. In fact, he never uses that term, spiritual Jews. What's the point? Even if he was saying that you can say spiritually you're Jewish if you're a Gentile, which is not his point that he's making, his point is Jews are still Jews and the promises still remain and God's dealing with Jewish people still remains. But the Jew who is really fulfilling God's purpose as a Jew is the one who's a Jew inwardly. Simple, and this is the vocabulary of Jew, the rest of the New Testament. All right, friends, remember to check out our very special resource offers for the most important books I've ever written. I think it's better than half price. Go to the website, askdrbrown.org. A great discount on life-changing books. Click on the video to find out more right on the homepage. It's The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. 
your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome to the line of fire. Our Christian spiritual Jews, this is Michael Brown. It is Thoroughly Jewish Thursday, but not taking calls today. Uh, gladly take your calls tomorrow if you want to continue this discussion. So we've just shown how from the Gospels through Acts, Jews are never, uh, Jew, Jews, these terms are never used to refer to Gentiles. Never. Always in distinction from Gentiles. And then in Romans, first chapter, the second chapter, uh, and then we're, we're questioning verses 28 and 29 of the second chapter, then the third chapter, ninth chapter, tenth chapter, and then references I didn't even get to in the last segment in Romans 15, where he's talking about the circumcised, speaking of Jews. He's always talking about Jewish people as opposed to Gentiles, in distinction from Gentiles. We all get saved the same way through Jesus. We have equal access to God. We have equal standing with God, but a Jew doesn't become a Gentile. A Gentile has become a Jew. What about 2, 28 and 29? His, Paul's point is that, that being Jewish is not merely outward, although God still sees Jews who are Jews outwardly and deals with them as Jews who are Jews outwardly and has scattered them and he regathered them as Jews outwardly. But the real, just like I said, the real man is, is not just a big, strong, tall guy, but a man who cares, a man who loves, a man who stands for what's right, a man who has integrity. That's a real man. It doesn't mean the others aren't men. So that's what he's saying here. And, and, and if you notice now, starting in 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 22, 23, 24, and then 1 Corinthians 9, 20, 1 Corinthians 10, 32, 12, 13, 2 Corinthians 11, 24, verse after verse after verse, where Paul refers to Jews, he's referring to Jews as distinct from Gentiles. 1 Corinthians 1, 22, for Jews uh, ask for signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. So the contrast between Jew and Gentile here. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block uh, to the Jews and to the Greeks, foolishness. 1 Corinthians 9.20, to the Jews I became a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To the Gentiles, like a Gentile, I might gain the Gentiles. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.32, give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. So here he's saying in particular that there remain people who are Jews even if they're not believers just as there are those who are Greeks as non-believers. Uh, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four, Paul writes from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. In other words, every single time so far, the, the word Jew has been used in the New Testament. It's close to 200 times, ultimately. Every time, uh, it's clearly speaking of a physical Jewish person and not of uh, a Gentile. In Romans 2, 28, 29, it's not the exception to all of that. Same in Galatians 2. Uh, where Paul talks about Jews meaning Jews. Galatians 2.13, 2.14, 2.15. 3.28, there's neither Jew or Gentile. We talked about that at the beginning of the broadcast. Uh, Colossians 3.11, the same thing, neither Jew nor Gentile. 1 Thessalonians 2.14, Paul talks about the bad treatment he experienced at the hands of his own uh, countrymen, his fellow Jews, just as the Thessalonians are experiencing rough treatment at the hands of their own countrymen. So that's telling me every single time the term occurs, every single time in the New Testament, it's clearly speaking about physical Jews, blood Jews, as distinct from Gentiles. And, and, and if one time in Romans 2, 28, 29, he used it in a metaphorical way to speak about a true believer, then he was just making a metaphorical point. But the better way to understand those is that he was actually talking about who's the real Jew. Not just outwardly, but inwardly as well. Yes, still a Jew, but the real Jew is one who's a Jew inwardly as well. Revelation 2.9 and 3.9, Jesus speaks of those who claim to be Jews and are not, but of the synagogue of Satan and are persecuting believers. Who are those? Either Jews who were persecuting believers and therefore not acting as true Jews. And in a typical prophetic sense, like when God says to Israel, you're not my people, even though he still dealt with them as his people. But he said, you're not my people. You're not right relationship with me anymore. You're not really my people, the way you're living. Well, he could be speaking to Jews like that and say, you're not Jew. You're persecuting Christians. Don't call yourself a Jew. You're, you're, you're the synagogue of Satan. Or he's talking about Gentiles, like black Hebrews today, who claim to be Jews and we're not. And we're synagogue of Satan. Either way, works the same. Flame, send the fire. 
It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. All right, let's do a little recap. Thanks for joining us on the Line of Fire. This is Michael Brown. It is Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. No calls today, just doing some teaching through the Word. Here's what we've learned so far. We've learned that the ecclesia is the congregation of the Lord. And with the coming of Jesus into the world and his death and resurrection and the door swinging wide open to Gentile believers at a level like never before, uh, the, the ecclesia has expanded its boundaries. Uh, the congregation of the Messiah, some would say the church, but the, better to say the congregation, has expanded its boundaries to include not just saved Israel, but saved from the nations to the point that it's now outnumber uh, the, the number of saved Jewish people. However, they do not take away Israel's role. They do not become Israel. They become part of the larger family of God, the commonwealth of Israel, like you'd have a European commonwealth for different nations. They become part of that, the extended people of God. But the promises that God gave to Israel still remain because of distinct promises that that God gave, just like distinct promises God gave to other nations in the Old Testament. If they still apply, they still apply today. So we're one in the Messiah. There's no caste system. Uh, There's no... A class system, there's no higher, lower, we're equal, we're one in the Messiah. However, the promises that God gave to the Jewish people that pertain to the land, that pertain to other aspects of, of their work in the earth, those still remain because each part of the body has its unique calling. We also saw that throughout the New Testament, the term Jew is never used generically for Christian. The term Jew is never used just to refer to a follower of Jesus. We are all spiritual Jews. We're all children of Abraham. Jew and Gentile in Jesus, we're all children of Abraham. Abraham believed before he was circumcised. Abraham believed after he was circumcised. He's the father of faith to both the circumcised and the uncircumcised. But the circumcised don't become uncircumcised. The uncircumcised don't become circumcised. We're all part of the same spiritual family, the ecclesia, the congregation, the church, the Messianic Assembly, were all children of Abraham by faith, but Gentiles don't become Jews and vice versa. You say, what about Romans 2, 28 and 29? There Paul is talking about the real Jew is not one who's only a Jew physically, but also spiritually, just like I could say, you're a real woman. It's not just someone who's attractive uh, or or, or someone who, who looks very feminine. The real woman is a woman of compassion. The real woman is a woman who, 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 who manifests the character of God in life. That's a real woman. He's not saying that other women aren't women. Other Jews aren't Jews. But here's a real woman. Here's a real man. Here's a real Jew. One on the inside as well as the outside. And in that sense, many Gentiles spiritually fulfill the calling of being a Jew better than a Jew. But that doesn't make the Gentile a Jew or the Jew a Gentile. And in Revelation 2 and, and 3, 2, 9 and 3, 9, where Jesus rebukes those who claim they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan, he's either talking about Jews who are hypocrites, they, they are claiming to be the people of God, and yet they are persecuting uh, other Christians, they are persecuting the followers of the Messiah, so they claim to be Jews, but they're not in terms of uh, uh, who a Jew should really be, or uh, he's, he's speaking of those who are imposters. Uh, They claim to be Jews, and they're not. They're really not Jews at all. Why? Because they're Gentiles, just like black Hebrews claim to be black Hebrews, and they're not. People claim to be, you know, British Israel. We're the real Israel, and and they're not. Okay, what what about the term Israel? Is Israel used in the New Testament to speak of the church? Does the church, does the New Testament say the church is spiritual Israel? No, it doesn't. Now, there are many things that are in common. There are many things that are spoken about the, uh, the church in the New Testament, or let's say even Gentile believers in the New Testament, that parallel what is spoken to Israel. Both are sons and daughters of the living God. All believers become a temple in which God lives, so we become his dwelling place. It's even possible that Paul in Philippians 3, this is debated, because he could be talking about his, his Jewish missionary co-workers, but it could well be that in Philippians 3, he's even telling Gentile believers that you are the circumcision. 
In, in other words, that you were the ones who were spiritually circumcised. And that's really going far. And yet nowhere does the New Testament say the church is the new Jacob, does it? You ever heard say when some, someone say, we're the new Jacob? That no, sounds strange, doesn't it? And nowhere does he say you are now spiritual Israel. So let's look at the data, all right? Uh, this term occurs not as many times, less than half as many times as Jew in the New Testament. Uh, but it, it begins in Matthew, the second chapter, the sixth verse, where I'm talking about Israel, uh, Israel in Greek, excuse me, Israel in Hebrew, Israel. All right, so there's a quote from Matthew 5, that the Messiah will rule God's people Israel. In Matthew 2, 6, Matthew 2, 20, uh, take the young child and his mother, word to Joseph, and go into the land of Israel, speaking of the physical land of Israel. Joseph arose, took the young child and his mother, came to Israel. No question Israel means Israel here, all right? Uh, when, when Jesus marvels at the great faith of the Gentile centurion, Matthew 8, he says, I haven't seen so much faith in Israel. So over and over in the Gospels, we see the same thing, that Israel means Israel. It means the physical land. It means the physical people. Matthew 15, 24, I'm not sent but, un- but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Same thing. The sick are healed. The people glorify the God of Israel. Matthew 19, Jesus speaks of a future time when his apostles will be judging, ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, and, and on and on it goes. Same thing. Israel means Israel means Israel. Right through Luke's gospel, the same thing. Luke 1, 16, many of the children of Israel, the Messiah will turn to the Lord. Uh, Luke, the second chapter, there's a man from Jerusalem uh, whose name was Simeon. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He's waiting for the Messiah to come. Right through Luke 24, um, uh, where, where the same thing occurs. We thought that he, these are the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, we thought that he would be the one to redeem Israel. John 1, uh, John the Immerser comes baptizing, verse 31, so the Messiah would be made manifest to Israel. John 12, 13th chapter, as Jesus comes in to make his triumphal entry, they say, blessed is the king of Israel. And the same thing in the book of Acts. Israel occurs in chapter 1, verse 6. The disciples want to know, at this time, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And by the way, he doesn't say, stupid, foolish, what a dumb question. Great question. Yeah, it's going to happen. It's just not for you to know the times and seasons. That's God's business. You go be witnesses. Acts 2, 36. Uh, there, there, Peter is rebuking his people. Let all the house of Israel know that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Acts 4, Acts 5, Acts 7, Acts 9, Acts 10, Acts 13, Acts 28, 20. Paul says, because of the the hope of Israel, I'm bound with this chain. Israel is Israel. No ambiguity whatsoever. You say, but what about Romans 9, 6? Romans 9, 6. Yeah, Paul says, not everyone in Israel is really Israel, meaning there's a remnant within the nation. Just like the real Jew is not just the one physically, but the one in spirit as well. Well, the same thing. He's not calling Gentiles Israel. He's not calling the whole ecclesia, the whole church Israel. He's saying, no, 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 no. Not everyone called Israel is really Israel in terms of the fullness of receiving the promises and living out God's purposes for Israel. There's an Israel within Israel. The Jewish believers, we are the Israel within Israel. But now notice he uses Israel in Romans 9.27, 9.31, 10.19, 10.21, 11.2, 11.7, 11.25, and every single time, look them up, look up the references, every single time, after saying not all Israel is Israel, notice there's an Israel within Israel, every single time thereafter, he speaks of Israel, without exception, He's talking about the nation as a whole, the nation as a whole, the nation as a whole, the nation as a whole. And, and, and then, then, what does it say in Romans eleven twenty five? 25? Hardness in part has happened to Israel. Gentile believers, says, I don't want you to miss this. Hardness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And so all Israel will be saved. The all Israel of whom he speaks is the Israel that has been hardened now is the Israel through uh, that will be saved. The ones that were hardened at the end of the age, there will be 
a turning. And in fact, I gave you Israel singular. Uh, there's even there are references to Israelites as well. But here are the references. Look them up for yourself. Romans 9, 27, 9, 31, 10, 19, 10, 21, 11, 2, 11, 7, 11, 25, 11, 26. So one time he says there's an Israel within Israel. And then he says, but let me talk to you about Israel, the nation, Israel, the people as a whole, over and over and over and over. Friends, the church has never called spiritual Israel anywhere in the New Testament. Yes, the people of God. Yes, sons and daughters of God. Yes, children of Abraham. Perhaps even the spiritual circumcision, but never spiritual Jews, never spiritual Israelites. That would be confusing matters, and often the church has gotten confused, which means they end up taking the promises that go to Israel, so Israel has them no more. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. All right, I'm actually going to do a little homework for you. I I listed a bunch of verses about Israel. Let let me go through these in the New Testament. First in Romans 9. I just want to focus on that one more moment to show that Paul is not saying that Israel is no longer Israel. He's just saying there's a remnant within Israel that has received the promises of the Messiah and are living as as the holy remnant, the Israel within Israel. All right, and in in the first five verses, he lays out the pain he has for his people after the flesh and reiterates that the covenants and the promises still belong to them. Romans 9, 6, he explains... But the present condition of Israel does not mean that the word of God has failed, for not everyone from Israel is truly part of Israel. Rather, it is the spiritual remnant. Indeed, not all the descendants of the seed of Abraham. Rather, what is to be called your seed will be an Isaac. In other words, it's the children of promise who are the Israel within Israel. Does that mean, then, that the nation of Israel today or those, the, the people of Israel, the Jewish people worldwide, are no longer Israel in God's sight. No, no, no. Paul now uses Israel again, Romans 9, 27. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Then the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. Who's Israel there? The whole nation, only a remnant of it is saved. Romans 9, 31. But Israel, which followed after a law of righteousness, has not attained the law of righteousness. Who is he talking about? The physical descendants of Israel. Romans 10, 19, did Israel not know? Who's he speaking about? The nation as a whole. I'll provoke you to jealousy over a non-nation. Romans 10, 21, to Israel, he says, all day long, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient contrary people. Who is he talking about? He's talking about the physical descendants of Israel. Romans eleven two 2, has God cast away his people whom he foreknew? No, uh, do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, meaning the nation as a whole? Uh, Israel has not obtained what it sought, Romans eleven seven, Romans eleven twenty five. hardness in part has happened to Israel. So you Gentiles, I don't want you to get this wrong, to think that God is forever done with Israel. I don't want you to get this wrong. Understand that over the nation, the Jewish people who don't believe as a people, over them, Hardness has come, but it's not complete. There's still a Jewish remnant that believes that at the end of the age, they will be saved, Romans eleven twenty six, And so all Israel will be saved, speaking of the nation as a whole. I mean, it's pretty clear. That's why fine exegete and fine commentary after another, one after another, says it's not talking about the salvation of the church as a whole. It's not talking about the accumulation of the remnant of believers in every age, uh, of Jewish believers. It's talking about the nation of Israel turning, and that is promised Numerous times in the Old Testament, national turning. Now, now look, Paul does say, observe Israel after the flesh. Look at the nation Israel. Look at physical Israel. In other words, not, not just the believers here, but, but look at the people of Israel. And, and, just, and, and by the way, it's interesting that most translations now don't even uh, translate with in the flesh. They just understand this means the people the nation, look at physical Israel, ESV, consider the people of Israel. Because some say Israel after the flesh, well, we're Israel after the spirit. Paul never says that. Paul never says that. 
So let's not put something in Paul's mouth that he didn't say. ESV, consider the people of Israel. Complete Jewish Bible. Look at physical Israel, physical Israel. Uh, Holman, Christian Standard. Look at the people of Israel. NIV, consider the people of Israel. NET, look at the people of Israel. Uh, L- NLT, look, think about the people of Israel. NRSV, consider the people of Israel. That's all he's saying. Uh, children of Israel in 2 Corinthians 3, 7 and 13, that's physical Israel. How about Galatians 6, 16? At the end of the book of Galatians, as many as order their lives by this rule, peace upon them in mercy and upon the Israel of God. You say, no, 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 no. The church is the Israel of God. He's talking about the Galatian believers. And he's saying, as, as in the, the, uh, the NIV, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. Well, why would Paul, after writing an entire letter to the Galatians, telling them they don't need to be circumcised, they don't need to obey the Torah of Moses, they don't need to live as Jews in order to be saved. Why would he then call them the Israel of God? Talk about confusing a matter. The Greek word chi, its most natural meaning is simply and. So what's Paul talking about? Well, what's interesting here, let's look. NRSV, and mercy, uh, peace and mercy upon the Israel of God. NET, uh, peace and mercy be on them and, and on the Israel of God. Uh, Holman, Christian standard, and mercy also be upon the people of Israel. So peace on those who follow the standard, and mercy also on the people of Israel. ESV, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Uh, NASB, peace and mercy be upon them, all who follow this rule, and on uh, uh, upon the Israel of God. King James, and upon the Israel of God. New King James, and upon the Israel of God. What's the point? overwhelmingly translators recognize it's not talking about the Gentiles there. It's talking about Jewish believers. He's talking about two distinct groups. All you Galatians I'm writing to, peace and mercy to those who follow this rule. And also, I'm not, I'm not throwing out Jews. I'm not throwing out Jewish believers. The same blessing and peace on the Israel of God, on Jewish believers. It's not calling the church spiritual Israel there. How about Ephesians 2.12? What does he say there? He's speaking of Gentiles who were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel that have now become part of the larger national life of Israel spiritually without becoming Israel. This is the one new man, Jew and Gentile together in the Messiah. Philippians 3, 5, it is possible. It is possible that Paul is uh, referring, uh, he speaks of himself there of course, as an Israelite. And in Ephesians, uh, Philippians 3, it is possible that he's referring to his uh, fellow workers there, his fellow Jewish apostles, as, uh, as the, the, we are the circumcision, the real circumcision, or it's possible that he's saying to, to the Gentile Christians in Philippi, hey, uh, look, you, you've got these people who are saying you have to be circumcised. You're the real circumcision spiritually. But he's not denying, he is not denying the reality of Israel being Israel. He's never calling the church spiritual Israel ever, never once in the New Testament. In Revelation 7, there are the 12 tribes of the, tri- the tribes of Israel, 12,000 of each. That represents the salvation of the Jewish people, I believe, and then a multitude no one can number that represents the church as a whole. We share together in the same nourishing root, going back to the Messiah, going back to the patriarchs, but Gentiles do not become Jews, and Jews do not become Gentiles. You're grafted into a larger tree of the people of God together, the Messianic congregation. But the promises that God gave to Israel remain because Israel remains Israel in his sight. The Jewish people remain Jews in his sight. Salvation only comes through Jesus Yeshua, but the promises remain. And those that God scattered in his anger, he has kept those people outside of Jesus, regathered those people, and will bring them one day at the end of the age into Jesus the Messiah himself. And for that, we fervently long and pray. I hope this makes sense to you. We covered a lot of ground, but I hope it makes sense. This is the website, AskDrBrown.org. Take advantage of this week's special offer. My bottom line today, as surely as God is God, he has made promises that he will not break, and those promises remain. To a physical, identifiable people, the people of Israel.